this under their watch. How on earth does he sleep at night with so much blood on his filthy, privileged hands? Well, tonight, that was uh, how Parliament reacted, but we're also going to try and find out how it's going down with voters. So we'll be hearing from Conservative supporters, a mother whose young son was fined for breaching COVID rules, plus we'll be talking to our viewers' panel as there. So we'll be talking to uh, the panel too. Uh, we'll also have some really top guests on the show, including the Northern Ireland Secretary, Brandon Lewis, Labour's Shadow Culture Secretary, Lucy Powell, and much more besides. That is all coming up on The Take. Hello, good evening. Well, Sue Gray says that senior leadership at the centre of government must bear responsibility for the partying and drinking culture in Number 10 that existed at the height of the pandemic. She says that people will be dismayed at the behaviour and had the right to expect better. Her report says there was fighting, people being sick and unacceptable treatment of security and cleaning staff. Well, Boris Johnson's apologised repeatedly and said that he was humbled, but he also said it was time to move on. Well, it was a long-awaited and explosive day in Westminster. Let's have a look at what happened. It's been published. Sue Gray's report into parties at Number 10 and Whitehall has now been published. And then look at this. The event lasted a number of hours. There was excessive alcohol consumption by some individuals. One individual was sick. There was a minor altercation between two other individuals. There you have it. There was essentially a fight in the heart of Whitehall because of excessive alcohol consumption. That ends Prime Minister's questions. For those who wish to leave. <laughs> <laughs> As we come to the statement, Prime Minister! When I said, I came to this House and said, in all sincerity, that the rules and guidance would be followed uh, at all times, it was what I believed to be true. I would like to correct the record uh, to take this opportunity, not in any sense to absolve myself of responsibility, which I take and have always taken. I, Mr Speaker, I, I am humbled and I have learned a, a lesson, Mr Speaker. They pretend that the Prime Minister has somehow been exonerated, as if the fact that he only broke the law once is worthy of praise. The truth is, they set the bar for his conduct lower than a snake's belly. Yeah. With a, a war in Europe, with an economic crisis, with the challenges this country faces, is it not really true that it is now time to turn a page? I made my point and my position very clear to the Prime Minister. He does not have my support. Can he think of any other Prime Minister who would have allowed such a culture of indiscipline to take place under their watch? And if it did, would they not have resigned? In this farce of a parliamentary system, it's now all down to Tory MPs, and there are not many left here, for them to grow a backbone and out this moral vacuum of a Prime Minister. Would he spare them the trouble and resign? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, Mr Speaker. Well, that is what happened uh, today in Parliament. And on tonight's show, we're also going to be trying to be working out just how much danger Boris Johnson still faces, especially with voters. Well, first on the programme, I spoke to the Northern Ireland Secretary to get his response to the report. Thank you very much for being on the programme today, uh, Mr Lewis. Late night parties, people getting so drunk that they're spilling wine around the room. They're throwing up, they're getting into fights. And this was going on in Downing Street while ordinary people were following the rules that those in number 10 had set. Should the Prime Minister now resign? No, the Prime Minister's um, taken responsibility for everything that was happening in number 10 and he has uh, apologised for that. I think he's set that out properly and rightly so. Obviously, these were things that were happening over a two-year period, much of which, obviously, some of these events, it turns out, looking at the report, the Prime Minister wasn't even in Number 10 at the time. But he has already taken on board some of what was set out in Sue Gray's uh, interim report, and as she's noted in the report today, has already been implementing the changes that were needed to be seen at Number 10 to change that culture and change the structure. 
You say that changes have been made, and I'll be honest, I'm struggling to see exactly what changes and who is taking responsibility for it. The Prime Minister isn't resigning. The head of the civil service, Simon Case, isn't resigning. Martin Reynolds, the man who invited 200 people to a party and then emailed to say we seem to have got away with it, he seems to be being moved to another plum job in the civil service. So how is this taking responsibility? Well, first of all, the Prime Minister has publicly taken responsibility for this. He made that point uh, very specifically uh, on the floor of the House of Commons yeah, as well. Just by saying uh, you're taking responsibility doesn't mean no, you there's are. There's no taking getting away from the. Well, well, he has taken responsibility. He has said he accepts the findings of the reports. He's accepted the findings of the, the, the police's uh, investigations as well. Uh, and he has changed the team at number 10. There's been a very, very big change in the team at number 10, not least of all the chief of staff, obviously. As you say, other people have left number 10 and different people have come in. There has been a change in structure there. And actually, Sue's Gray's report uh, it, today itself outlines that she acknowledges that there has been change that she thinks is delivering on what she set out in that interim report, which is change, what the Prime Minister just to come said back do. In, just to come uh, back he's in. Done that. Just to come back in. The head of the civil service, Simon Case, isn't resigning. Martin Reynolds, the man who sent out an email to 200 people, is being moved to another job, we understand. The Prime Minister isn't resigning. There may be a change in personnel in number 10, but it seems to be completely unrelated to who actually should be taking responsibility to some of what's going on. Well, there has been, as you say, change at number 10. As I say, quite a substantial change at number 10 in the team that have come in there now uh, and are working through and getting on with the job of working for the country and delivering for people across the country on a whole range of issues. And that's where the focus um, has been. And as I say, the, over the, I think it is right that the, the Sue Gray report itself recommended that there was change. There was a, clearly a need for some cultural change there. And some of the things in the report today do make difficult reading. Um, and that's why I think it was right the Prime Minister set out as he did on the floor of the House today. You tweeted to say the PM has apologised unreservedly and is already implementing the recommendations for change. We must now get on and deliver for the British public as they rightly expect. What is your evidence that the British people do want you to just get on with things and deliver rather than taking responsibility and for the Prime Minister to resign? I think there's a, a number of things come together. I think, look, first of all, we have got an unprecedented situation in this country. We're still recovering from the pressures of COVID and what that's done to our economy and our wider society. Obviously, the fallout from the war in Ukraine and dealing with those issues that have also had a knock-on effect in terms of food prices and also energy prices, where we're seeing this global pressure on energy prices, this global battle with inflation that is having an impact on people across the country. I think these are issues that people want a government to be focused on and delivering on what they elected us to do in 2019. But I go further than that and say to you, look, over the last uh, few weeks, obviously, we've had local elections. One of the things I've seen when I've been out and about talking to people in those elections and actually talking to people outside of elections time as well, as I do with my own constituents, is people wanting to see us focused on the issues that are affecting their everyday lives and working, particularly at the moment, to ensure that we get um, some structure around what is happening in Ukraine, because people do care about what's happening in Ukraine, a, a sovereign democratic country, and that they believe we're doing the right thing by supporting the people of Ukraine and the Ukrainian government, but also dealing with those issues such as the pressures on cost of living that they're seeing through the pressures on inflation, particularly the challenges around energy that people are seeing. And that's what I'm getting in my mailbox, is what I get when I talk to people on the doorsteps, that they want to see us dealing with those core issues. That's what they elected us to do, and that's what they want to see us deliver on. Of course, you know, I'm not saying that people don't care about all those things, but people can also care about integrity in public life and whether or not parties were going on in number 10 while everyone else was following I'm... the rules. And the reason I ask for evidence is because the evidence that I'm seeing, you know, a snap poll by YouGov, showing three in five Britons say Boris Johnson should resign compared to just 30% who say he should stay in the, in the role. Has the Prime Minister saved his job but lost the next general election for you? Uh, I, sorry, sorry, I didn't catch all of that, but I think I, I, I got enough at the back end of your question there to know what you're saying. Look, as we all know from uh, years of experience and yourself as a journalist in politics and myself as a politician, is polls are a snapshot in time. Uh, the reality is the, the votes that count are what we see in a general election. Look, I've said before quite openly, I think that Boris Johnson is the right man to be leading our country. I think he will lead the Conservative Party into the next general election, and I do think he will win it, and I think he'll do that because people will see that when they elected us in 2019, they did that on a 
manifesto that we will have delivered on and we will be delivering on the things people elected us to do, but also look at those big decisions that the Prime Minister's had to make, whether it's through the decisions around COVID or the decisions uh, with the support for Ukraine. And I think people will see over the months ahead, as we supported people through COVID, we're determined to do everything we can to support people through that global challenge of inflation. And I think getting those big decisions right are another reason why people will put their confidence in the Prime Minister again to see us through the next general election as well. Now, there's one thing that I am, I'll be honest, a little bit puzzled about today. Sue Gray didn't investigate the alleged party in the Prime Minister's flat that happened on the 13th of November 2020. Now, this is when five aides joined the Prime Minister's wife at 6pm. The Prime Minister then joined at 8pm. Food and alcohol were available and then it went on into the evening. In your view, was that breaking the rules? Well, the, the police have looked at this and Sue Gray, as uh, well, we've seen, we've seen Sue Gray's report, Sue Gray looked at it, the police have not fined uh, the Prime Minister beyond the fixed penalty notice that he has already outlined. So clearly, well, the police who looked at everything and had, the police and Sue Gray had access to far more uh, details and documentation than either you or I have had. And I respect the decisions they've come to. And I think we've got a, um, and I have absolute confidence in the police to have done a, a thorough job, as they always do. So I'm, I think I'm not it's talking clear about from the that, that there, there is a view that those rules were not broken in that way. I'm not talking about the police investigation, I'm talking about the Sue Gray investigation. And I'm just really puzzled as to why she didn't investigate the one thing, the one event that could have caused the most problems for the Prime Minister, the alleged party that took place inside his own flat. Now, we know Boris Johnson had a meeting with Sue Gray before the publication of this report, instigated by Number 10. Did they discuss at all whether or not the flat party would be investigated? Well, as Sue Gray has put in her report, obviously she's been, uh, she's had access to all the information that she has asked for and, and has had information she said in her report that she hadn't asked for where people have come forward with information. Obviously the police had the ability to look at anything and everything they wanted to look at. They, said they have clearly only issued one fixed penalty notice to the Prime Minister, as he has outlined, um, and he has dealt with that. Uh, look, as I say, I don't know the details of private meetings. What I can say is somebody who has worked with Sue Gray, both when she was dealing with uh, ethics and probity in the Cabinet Office and in her uh, role here in Northern Ireland and her role now um, in uh, the department looking at issues around the union. Sue Gray is an independently minded, very, very focused professional civil servant and she will have done whatever she feels was necessary to produce a report that she thinks is right. I don't think anybody could question either her professionalism or independence and I trust the judgment that she has come to and I think she's come and written a report that does make difficult reading in places. I think that's why it's right that the Prime Minister outlined, as I said, today not only his apology but has taken the action that was recommended in her interim report as well. In that meeting between the Prime Minister and Sue Gray, is it correct that he suggested that she could drop the report? I, I wasn't in a meeting between the Prime Minister and Sue Gray, so I'm not going to comment on a meeting I wasn't in. I think look, the reality is Sue Gray's report is out there. Sue Gray has published her report. I don't think, believe for one moment the Prime Minister would have d interfered in any way in the report. He has been very clear. I have okay, to say so in you... conversations I've seen him outline both publicly and, 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 and... Sorry, let me just finish, Sophie. The Prime Minister has always been very clear. He wanted to see these reports come through, both Sue Gray's report and the police investigation come to its completion so that people would have the full facts out there to be able to draw their own conclusions and for him to be able to outline and answer those points as he has done uh, both with the interim report with Sue Gray, the fixed penalty notice and that final report and the statement he's given today. I'll be honest, I feel like I'm struggling to get the full facts of everything that went on. Do you know, you say you don't know what happened between the Prime Minister and Sue Gray at that meeting. Have you not asked the question? Have you not tried to find out? Because it does feel, you know, if this is a meeting set up by Number 10, uh, ahead of the publication. No, no, no Sophie, I can answer that very directly. No, I haven't. No, 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 Sophie, it's very simple. No, I haven't, because I have to Why say, not? having worked both with the Prime Minister, who I know what he, where his focus is on the issues that affect people across the country and those domestic issues people want the Prime Minister dealing with around the economy and around those international challenges that we're facing. And as you have, as I say, having worked with Sue Gray on a, a range of issues over the years, I have absolute respect for Sue Gray's independence. Sue Gray will not be... Um, somebody who shies away from taking tough, tough decisions and giving tough messages to people when she needs to. And I think she's proven that through her career and with the report today. OK, so you, you're very upfront and honest, for full credit to say you haven't asked what went on in that meeting between the Prime Minister and Sue Gray. Is that because, really, you don't necessarily want to know the answer? Because if you perhaps did know the answer, it would be a lot more difficult to come on programmes like this and defend the Prime Minister's conduct. Uh, look, Sophie, I'm always happy to come on your programme in any situation I've 
come and talk to you about a whole range of issues and challenges over the years. Uh, and no, that's not the reason at all. It's as I just outlined to you. Look, I know the Prime Minister. I work with the Prime Minister. I know Sue Gray and I've worked with Sue Gray in a number of different jobs in government over the years. And I've <laughs> I had no question or doubt whatsoever that Sue Gray would put out the report that she wanted to put out with no fear or favour to do the right thing. She is a very professional civil servant and she is somebody who will always speak truth to power. I've experienced that. I've seen her do that. And it's why she's such a talented civil servant. OK, as you say, um, you have come on a programme, my programme, over the years, defending uh, Boris Johnson, defending Theresa May as well, when you were working under her. Uh, definitely one of these people who comes on to, you know, g give the defence of, of the government. So, putting that aside, I just want to talk to you as a, as a person for a minute. What would you say to the people in Britain, many of who made huge, huge sacrifices during the pandemic, some of them who lost loved ones and they weren't even allowed to see them, in hospital when they were ill or when they were in care homes. What would you say to them when they look at the report, they look at what was going on in Number 10? No, that's a very fair question, Sophie, parties, yeah. What would you say? No, it's a, it's, a, it, it's a very fair question. And, look, obviously I have spoken to people who have been in that situation, both people I know and uh, through, through work as well. And, look, I absolutely understand the, the upset, the anger, the frustration people have at what they uh, could see was going on and what was happening at Number 10. It's why it's not acceptable. It's why I think it was right that the Prime Minister took those actions. Uh, obviously, Number 10 is, a, is, a, is not just a, is a place of work, but it's also a home. And it's, a, it's one of those places, you know, Sophia, that, uh, that the, the, the space in there is used across Number 10 consistently. But that's no excuse for, and particularly, as I say, some of the difficult things to report today. And one of the comments in there, I think the Prime Minister raised on the floor of the House today as well, around how some of the staff have been spoken to by other people. It's just not acceptable. And that's why it is right. The Prime Minister is very clear about that apology, both to people generally across the country and to those affected by this um, situation, both in terms of how they've been treated and dealt with in Number 10 and um, the perception that that has created across the country. So look, I do understand that, but that doesn't move away from the reality that I know, and having worked um, as a member of the Cabinet through COVID, with all conversations we've been having in the work I've seen the Prime Minister focused on, whether it's widely for the UK or here in Northern Ireland, his focus has always been on doing the right thing to deliver for people across the country. And, and that's why I think he has got those big decisions right. Brandon Lewis, thank you very much for being on the programme today. You're very welcome. Thank you. Brandon Lewis uh, there saying the Prime Minister has apologised, change has happened in Number 10 and now the country wants them to get on with the business of government. You're watching The Take, you are live here in Westminster with us. Up next, we're going to be talking to Labour's Lucy Powell to get her take on the Sue Gray report. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Well, we just heard the government's take from uh, Brandon Lewis, but it was a little bit uncomfortable for the Labour front bench at times too, because Keir Starmer was uh, attacked, of course, Boris Johnson over the Sue Gray report, but the PM was able to retort that Keir Starmer was himself under investigation by the police and should resign. Well, let's get Labour's take now. We're joined by the Sec Shadow Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, Lucy Powell, who joins us now. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for being with us. Um, what is your reaction to Sue Gray's report? Well, I mean, it's, it's very revealing, isn't it? The industrial scale partying that was happening at Downing Street, the lack of judgment, the poor leadership, the fact that these things were allowed to go ahead uh, with great frequency and that they were sanctioned uh, in, in effect. And the Sue Gray report makes clear that that book really should stop with the Prime Minister and the political leadership of Downing Street. But we heard from the Prime Minister today that while he says he takes responsibility, he's not owning any responsibility at all because he's not taking any action himself or recognising that he himself is at fault. It seemed to be everybody else's fault but his own. The Sue Gray report, it obviously does, it obviously, you know, really condemn a lot of what went on in Number 10. But at the same time, it does feel like it stops short of calling for Boris Johnson to resign, if you like. And she also says in her report, in her conclusions, that she's pleased that progress is being made in addressing the issues I raised. We heard Brandon Lewis saying that there have been changes of personnel in Downing Street. So do you accept that Sue Gray appears to be at least partially satisfied that the government's listening? Well, look, at the end of the day, Sue Gray, although she's a woman of great integrity, I, I know Sue, uh, and she, of course she is, and she did an independent inquiry, she is nonetheless 
a civil servant and she makes that clear in her report as well, that it's not for her to issue disciplinary action or sanctions. It is for the political leadership of Number 10 Downing Street, i.e. the Prime Minister, to then take steps against those who are responsible. But she does say that she's pleased progress is being made. Well, some progress is being made, but she also says that this was an issue of leadership, of judgement, and of political uh, leadership, and that junior staff and others uh, often only took part in these events because they were sanctioned by the Prime Minister himself because he was at them. And, you know, that's why he's got to take responsibility uh, for, for this matter. And also because he lied to Parliament. He came to Parliament and he said no such uh, parties took place, uh, nothing uh, happened and all the rules uh, were followed. And that clearly is now not the case. I and mean, that's he, why he really does need to resign he, and take responsibility. He argues that he said that in good faith, that he didn't believe that rules were broken. And he also points to the fact that the police have only fined him for the one single event. And that the other, ev the other events uh, that he's alleged to have taken part in, the police actually said that no rules were broken on his part. Well, he has got a fine. That means he did uh, break the law. That's what that means. He broke the law. Uh, quite clearly, and I think that is a resignation offence. He broke the law in Number 10 Downing Street, where there were 126 fines issued. If that had been a restaurant, a nightclub, a school or a hospital during the pandemic, it would have been shut down by the authorities for that level of uh, rule breaking and events uh, happening. And he says he he thought that it was within the, the guidelines. I'm, I'm really sorry. I mean, he's either misleading us all and, and lying, which I believe is the case, or he's incredibly stupid. Um, and, you know, if he's incredibly stupid, then he's not fit to be Prime Minister either. And, um, you know, I think the bigger issue here is that all the while, the months and months we've been uh, talking about this issue, and I know your viewers, along with everybody else, will on, on one level be fed up uh, of hearing about this whole sorry affair, People's bills have been going through the roof and the cost of living is soaring and people are facing real hardship and challenges and the government hasn't been able to focus on these big issues facing the country because they are at disarray and they, you know, they're, they're dysfunctional. There's a problem though, isn't there? Um, just taking a step back today. There's a problem because Keir Starmer is also, of course, uh, being investigated by police for an alleged breach of COVID rules. And that makes it very, very easy for Boris Johnson to throw that right back at him, doesn't it? I don't think so, because Keir Starmer, unlike Boris Johnson, has said he would take the ultimate responsibility were he found to have broken, broken the law. And he said that if he is given a fine, which he uh, firmly believes he won't be, because this was uh, clearly was a, a work occasion and a, and a work uh, break, uh, to have a, a takeaway with only work colleagues in a, in a small environment there away from home. But that if he is found to have broken the law, then he would resign. And, and that so sets are... him massively apart from the Prime Minister. But we are in a situation now, aren't we, where it appears more likely that Keir Starmer could end up resigning over Partygate than Boris Johnson. Well, I don't know that it appears more likely. Well, but it doesn't feel like it, Boris Johnson's about to resign, Well, no, it? that's because he won't ever do the honourable thing. But it, and he it won't do possible. the right thing. And he won't... He's not someone who will take responsibility but for it, his own actions. So it does look actions. like it's more likely that Keir Starmer could lose his job over this, then, doesn't it? Well, I don't think it's more likely, because I don't think Keir Starmer has broken uh, the rules. But, obviously, I think it's very unlikely that this particular Prime Minister will take responsibility for his own actions, breaking the law in number 10, having parties on an industrial scale when we couldn't all go to people's funerals, we were having Christmas on Zoom, uh, you know, we were missing birthdays, missing loved ones, missing those really important times in life. And the Prime Minister stood up today in Parliament and seemed to suggest that he thought it was OK because... Uh, this was a well-deserving colleague who, who deserved a good toast and a, a send-off uh, as a leaving party. Well, I'm sure that many people watching this programme feel like their close loved ones deserved a good send-off for dying during COVID and they weren't uh, able to do that. And that is absolutely appalling. And I felt the Prime Minister today really had quite a tin ear about this whole situation. He seemed uh, to, to sort of bluster his way through 
not accepting any responsibility. It does feel, um, you know, as you say, that it looks unlikely uh, that Boris Johnson is going to lose his job, at least in, 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 imminently over this. You know, given that you know, three in five voters, according to YouGov, think he should resign, electorally, is that quite a good thing for Labour? Well, I don't, I don't think it's a good thing for the country and but, I don't think it's a good thing for politics, actually. But because, electoral, do you th electorally, do you think it might be a good thing for Labour? Well, it's, it's not a good thing for the Conservative Party, so in, in that sense, you know, maybe so. But actually, I'm not really interested in that, to be honest. I'm interested in uh, us having a government that's able to govern and lead and deal with the very real crisis that people are facing today, which this government isn't able to do. We can't wait for a general election to solve this cost of living crisis. We need the government to take action now and we need them to take it on a scale and at a pace that is cons consummate with the crisis that we are facing and they're just not doing that. Well, we may hear a bit more on that, of course, because uh, we are going to get a statement from the Chancellor uh, tomorrow. Lucy Powell, thank you very much for being on the so, programme uh, this evening. Lucy Powell uh, there. Well, pretty clear what Labour thinks, uh, but what about voters? Well, we went to, to the all-important Conservative heartland of Tiverton in Devon, where there is very soon to be a by-election. That's after the Conservative MP Neil Parrish resigned after watching porn in the Commons to try and find out what they thought of it all. Russia trying to take over, threatening nuclear destruction. Don't you think that's far more important than a few drinks and a bit of cake? Really, let's be fair. He's not stupid. Forget it. Let him get on with his life. Let him get on with, with the job he should be doing. There's more serious things going on in the world. I don't care if he had a crisp and a glass of wine. How many people can say heart, hand on heart that they didn't break just by having somebody in to have a drink? A bit annoyed, yeah. Because, like, couldn't see my mum, we had to FaceTime, and um, it was hard. Really hard, wasn't it? We'll find out exactly what uh, voters in Tiverton think uh, in a few weeks' time when we've got that by-election. But in the meantime, we can try and work out a bit more about where we are tonight with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates, who joins us now. Sam, I have to level with you. You know, we've texted an awful lot of Conservative MPs uh, today uh, and a lot of them keeping their powder dry. Where do you think the Prime Minister is at? It's the irony there, Sophie, is actually, and I think today's report came out at the really better end for Boris Johnson than it could have done. Here's why. In her final report, Sue Gray said the senior leadership at the centre, both political and official, must bear responsibility for this culture which she sets out of the parties, all the activities that you mentioned at the top. But she also gave everybody on the Conservative benches in government a massive wiggle room, which is what she doesn't do is specify how Boris Johnson in particular set the culture in a way that was so loose, which created so much unacceptable behaviour. There is nothing in her report that suggests that he instigated, was aware of most of the events that we have been reading about today. And that is a massive wiggle room. And I watched Brandon Lewis jump through it in his interview uh, with you this evening. It's also created an enormous problem, really, for the Labour Party. Um, how do they respond in this environment where they can't, they haven't been given anything by Sue Gray with which to sort of beat Boris Johnson, having taken that enormous gamble that Keir Starmer took to promise to resign himself and to call for Boris Johnson to resign, now that's fallen flat. It doesn't look right now that he's going anywhere. So where does that leave the opposition parties? It's interesting, isn't it? Um, because it does feel um, as though the one event, the flat alleged party, hasn't been looked at by Sue Gray yet, and I can't really work out why not. So, uh, the explanation for Sue Gray as to why she didn't go into the details of this event where uh, Boris Johnson was there, there was food and there was wine, there was uh, a number of special advisers, is that the police looked at it and they decided not to issue any fines and therefore she decided not to go into it any further. Now, the thing is, there's no automatic reason why, if one is the case, the other should automatically follow. Why, if the police didn't find it, couldn't Sue Gray uh, actually look at this in any more detail. We don't know. There are reports, I'm sure you've heard as well, I've certainly heard them, that people in the number 10 building could hear the dancing, the jumping up and down on the floors to ABBA uh, at that event. But no, that remains a mystery, even though it was one that was considered most sensitive inside number 10. So that's a mystery. The other mystery, of course, is what happened at that conversation between Sue Gray and Boris Johnson that we revealed uh, on Friday. Uh, and uh, whether or not Boris Johnson did indicate that he was um, curious as to what Sue Gray would have to say 
in the event that the police concluded, was there any hint, perhaps there wasn't any necessity to go into the flat party, for instance? Yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, Sam, thank you very much uh, indeed. And as Sam uh, was saying there, it does certainly feel uh, as though uh, Boris Johnson isn't going anywhere imminently. You're watching The Take. We are live uh, in Westminster for you this evening. But up next, we are going to try and find out what the public think after the aftermath of that crucial report. Could be the most important thing of all. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You are watching The Take. Well, time now to delve a little bit deeper, deeper into the details of Sue Gray's report now. Our deputy political editor, Sam Cope, has been going through it all. After six months of waiting, 37 pages, Sue Gray's story of what went on in Westminster over 11 critical months of the pandemic. The picture clear. While the country was locked down and banned from socialising, parts of Whitehall partied hard. There are numerous examples of terrible behaviour in Whitehall at the height of the pandemic. Let's trot through some of the worst examples, such as this event. Now, this was in June 2020, an event attended not only by the Cabinet Secretary, but also his deputy, who was the ethics chief, who brought her own karaoke machine. Sue Gray writes, the event lasted for a number of hours. There was excessive alcohol consumption by some individuals. One individual was sick. There was a minor altercation between two other individuals. So there was a fight in Whitehall at the height of the pandemic because of drunkenness. Or let's look at Christmas that year. Now, there were three different events on one day in the lead up to Christmas, two of which took place in Downing Street. Sue Gray writes, a cleaner who attended the room in Downing Street the next morning noted that there had been red wine spilled on one wall and on a number of boxes of photocopier paper. Worth saying in this report, by the way, that there are examples apparently of people inside number 10 being rude to cleaners and other staff after some of these events which appalled many on opposition benches. Wild behaviour of various forms and plenty in government acknowledging in private they were breaking the rules. The best way to illustrate that they knew what they were doing was wrong was to examine the bring your own booze event synonymous I think with Partygate. Look at this, ahead of that event Lee Kane who was a director of communications emailed Martin Reynolds, the top official number 10 who organised it, and said this. A 200-odd person invitation for drinks in the garden of number 10 is somewhat of a comms risk, a PR risk, in the current environment. Lee Kane goes on to say that he m warned Martin Reynolds in person. So, too, did Dominic Cummings, who says he gave a warning as well. But the warnings were ignored. The event went ahead. Boris Johnson was there for 30 minutes. 30 to 40 people turned up. And in the end, the police fined many of those who attended. Yet, in the weeks after it took place, you can see this. A media advisor messaged Martin Reynolds about a story inquiry and he replied, well, that's a complete non-story, but better than, the focusing, than focusing on our drinks, which we seem to have got away with. Bad behaviour and clear delight at having got away with it. But the question hanging over Sue Gray's investigation has always been, what did Boris Johnson know and how much blame should he get? There's nothing in the report that suggests that Boris Johnson was involved in organising or even knew about many of the parties in this report. Downing Street will also be relieved that there's nothing in here incriminating about allegations of a party in the Downing Street flat. Sue Gray started investigating it, but when the Metropolitan Police decided that they weren't going to issue any fi fixed penalty notices to do with it, she concluded it was not appropriate or proportionate to do so. So what are the conclusions? Well, Sue Gray says the senior leadership at the centre, both political and official, must bear responsibility for this culture. But she suggests it's already being fixed. She made some suggestions in January and I am pleased progress is being made in addressing the issues I raise. That suggests that there are no specific changes she wants to see. Downing Street will be very relieved by that conclusion. Painful, yes. But in the circumstances, the best number 10 could hope for, with little new information to transform the debate and broad brush conclusions that don't point the finger at the Prime Minister. Is it now over? Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Sam Coates, sir, there. Is it over? Well, maybe according to the politicians, but of course the most important verdict is from voters. So I'm really keen, actually, uh, to see what our viewers' panel uh, made of it all. Uh, they're weighted, they're politically balanced. Uh, so let's have a little look uh, at what they make uh, of the actions today. Uh, hello, everyone. Good to see you all. Now, just before I get to uh, talking to you all individually, I'd like to see a bit of a show of hands. If you think Boris Johnson should resign after the publication of that report, I want you to put your hand in the air. So put your hand up 
if you think Boris Johnson should resign? That makes pretty balanced. One, two, three, four, five people who say that they think he should resign. And if you don't think he should resign, put your hand up now. If you don't think he should resign, three people there who don't think Boris Johnson should resign. So you can see, actually, that's quite reflective, actually. It almost, I think that in some ways uh, does reflect the uh, YouGov poll, uh, where about uh, three-fifths of people uh, said uh, they, they thought he should resign, so a small majority. Well, let's talk to Stella first, shall we? Now, Stella, uh, you uh, said that you don't think uh, Boris Johnson uh, should uh, resign. Uh, why is that, Stella? No, I think um, his leadership is disappointing um, because we'd all like to see men and women of integrity leading the party and leading the country. Um, but it's finding some to, someone to replace him. So I'm not saying that he's the best person for the job or that he should be leading the country, but I'm just saying that I, I, I failed to find anyone who could take his place. I think it's become increasingly difficult to trust any politicians and we begin to trust them and then we find out they've done something abominable and we lose our trust in them. There you go, so, so it does feel that's like... That's my reasoning, but... Yeah. It does feel perhaps that you're losing a faith in all of them then, uh, Stella, rather than just Boris on his own. Thank Good to talk to you uh, there. Uh, I want to go all the way to uh, our youngest panellist now, and that is Tom, Tom Horn. Now, what I'm interested to hear from you, Tom, is that November 2020, when some of these parties were taking place, you were at university and you told one of our researchers uh, that on Fridays you found the police patrolling your corridors. Of course, in Downing Street, they were having what's known as WTF Fridays. <laughs> wine time Friday, so a bit yeah. different perhaps from your own university experience. Yeah, I think that's what's really made me so angry about all of this is that we literally, you couldn't leave your house, your flat, you can, you know, people would go down to the supermarket and come back and be asked what they were doing, why they were, why they were going shopping, even if they'd, you know, gone out for a bottle of wine or just for, you know, a takeaway for themselves because... None of us were allowed to mix. And if you were, you were fined by the university, by the accommodation provider, and sometimes by the police as well. And yeah, they did used to patrol the corridors. And I think maybe if they'd had that in Downing Street, then maybe there would have been a bit more discipline. Uh, interesting stuff. So, Tom, uh, not a Conservative voter. You said that if you were old enough, you'd have voted Green or Lib Dems. Let's talk to Rob Tyler now, because you are a Conservative voter, aren't you, Rob? Um, what do you make of the uh, report? Well... I found it to be a little bit wishy-washy, to be honest. Uh, there was nothing new came out. And uh, point three in the conclusions, she says that um, many of the events shouldn't have taken place, which means that she feels that some of the events were fine to take place. It'd be interesting, rather than seeing the mudslinging, to find out which ones were fine, which ones were OK. Yeah, quite hard to imagine, uh, really, if you're looking back, uh, which ones would have been allowed over the, under the rules. But it, um, interesting anyway. Uh, let's talk to Pradeep now, shall we? Uh, Pradeep Sakataran, who is a Labour voter. You're based in uh, London. Um, what did you make uh, of uh, the, the report? And do you think the Prime Minister should resign? Yeah, I, I thought the report read like a diary uh, of a comprehensive uh, set of events, but it was very weak on consequences and follow-up procedures and guidelines should be, that should be adhered in the future. Uh, it felt like a slap on the wrist of, for the Prime Minister and a slap in the face for the British public. And I do feel like the Prime Minister should resign because leadership is about integrity and also setting example for the national policy and also international policies. We cannot have our leaders uh, state that they want to steer world events and just be hypocritical in national events. So uh, what does that say about us on an international stage? So pretty, pretty critical there of uh, the government. Uh, well, let's bring in Hannah, shall we? Hannah Walker, uh, you uh, voted Labour at the last election. Uh, Hannah, um, what do you make of Partygate? I think we need to go slightly back a square and remember that parties were actually not allowed and disguising what we all know are parties as with, with hindsight as work events um i i think is is muddying the waters and i think to a certain extent we've forgotten that we know 
we have intrinsic values. We have a sense of fairness within us. And we look at those pictures and we know they were parties. It doesn't matter what you call them. They were parties. They were parties, you and say, it's clear. Uh, yeah, interesting to hear. So you're pretty actually scathing of what uh, was going on uh, there as well. Uh, let's bring in uh, Dr uh, Paul Blom uh, at, this at this point, because it's quite interesting to hear from you know, different supporters from different parties. But, Paul, you're a Conservative uh, voter, but it feels to me like you might be losing a bit of faith with Boris Johnson. Would that, would that be right? Yeah, yes, I, I, I certainly am. I mean, for me, uh, in the report, when it, it says there was a lack of judgment and leadership, I think that's very telling um, and I, it reflects badly on Boris Johnson. Um, and my, my concern actually with this whole affair, and I can understand people getting very bored with it all, is that it's causing damage to our democracy and our political system and, and, and leading to people perhaps to not engage with politics, which I think is very wrong. And there are lots of principled um, politicians but I think they're getting very bad press from that element that's that's causing uh, all the contro this controversy. Yeah, interesting um, to hear. Yeah. And uh, and I'd be interested to see now with the, with the two by elections coming up, what happens to the Conservative MPs? Whether they're going to be putting in their letters after the results of the by could be seeing uh, could be seeing a bit of a kicking in those by election results. So let's, let's bring in Lisa Goddard, uh, shall we? And Lisa, I know that you know you've had personal experience of the sacrifices that many people made uh, during uh, COVID, reasons, I guess, to be angry uh, towards uh, the passing in uh, number 10. How are you feeling? Oh, Lisa, I'm sorry. I don't think we can hear you right now. Uh, I'm going to try and come back to you. Uh, oh. I am here, if that's okay. Oh, great, you are. Keep going. Sorry about that. We, we lost yep. you momentarily. Well, two things that angered me today was uh, Boris, he repeatedly says they're going to put their arms around people and the fact that he felt it was appropriate in his duty to say goodbye. I felt it my duty to say goodbye to my best friend, uh, to my uh, uh, elderly family friend that we have she was taken into hospital she caught covid in hospital we were not allowed to see her we my mum got a phone call at 2 a.m in the morning to say Anne's passed away would you like to come and see her i would have liked to have seen her before i would have liked to have had time with my best friend before uh, it, it, he can't keep saying put your arms around people it pains me every time I hear it, uh, and uh, the fact that he just felt it his duty to say goodbye, I, I just find it offensive, and, and today I am angry. And it's not to do with partisan or being Labour supporter. I would feel exactly the same, whoever was in the situation, whatever their political allegiance. Thank you for you know, sharing your story, and I think it does. it is really important to hear from people like yourself who have you made those big sacrifices during the pandemic, not seeing people that the closest to them. Um, so we appreciate you sharing that. Um, let's have a very quick uh, thought uh, to uh, end, uh, shall we? Uh, this is Vic Daniels. Uh, you're a Conservative uh, supporter. You're in London. What, what did you make uh, of Partygate and the report? Um, just quickly, I suppose I should say that I get why people are angry. Everyone, as you say, has got a story. Um, but I think if you look at, at Boris in his career, and especially the last five months, we didn't learn anything from the Sue Gray report. We know he likes to drink. We know he likes to party. We know there are judgment issues, integrity issues and leadership issues. But you have to look at it as a package. He's got a lot of things right. The EU, he got, he's, he's got right or he's got us in a position to get it right. The vaccine, he got that right. The financial support package, he got a lot of that right. And let's face it, he's having a fairly good war. So I think in the round... Uh, my own personal view as a Conservative voter, as someone who voted for him in 2019, we now have to draw a line on it and look at the okay. big macro issues that are going to impact the most of the population. OK, thank you very much. And thank you uh, for some really strongly uh, expressed viewpoints uh, today. It was really interesting to hear uh, everybody's uh, take there. Well, uh, lots of takes uh, this evening, lots of strong feelings. Uh, let's have a bit of a post-match roundup with our deputy political editor, uh, uh, Sam Coates. Uh, interesting from our panel, the majority uh, saying uh, that Boris Johnson should resign, although some were saying that actually it's time to draw a line under the whole matter. What does the polling show? 
Well, I think it shows exactly that. The, the panel is right. And I think what you can see here, should Boris Johnson resign following Seagrove's report, this is a snap poll from YouGov, 59% say yes. Which Almost is kind exactly of, the same as ex the panel. E exactly. But what I want to say about this number is that I think whatever you thought before Sue Gray's report, your mind hasn't been changed by what you saw today. You just think it more. So if you were cross before, you're crosser. If you didn't care, you thought the media were going on about it, you think that even more because we're still going on about it. But do you think something's going to happen? Let's look at the next number. And this is about whether or not you think, uh, 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 well, Conservative voters should. Now, look at that. This is very partisanish, and only 27%. So you've got 59% of the voters as a whole, 27% uh, of, um, uh, of those who vote Conservative. Now, let's look uh, about uh, amongst those who say uh, that they think that Boris Johnson will resign. Only 7%. Wow. So even though a lot of people think he should, almost nobody think... He will. And I think that's ultimately, right <laughs> that's probably the judgment tonight on the basis of what you're seeing today. But, Sophie, this isn't over. Not this, as in the Partygate scandal. I think probably Sue Gray's report has drawn a bit of a line under that. But questions about Boris Johnson, his premiership? Well, there are just going to be so many more. Why? Because the country is facing some of the most difficult challenges with the cost of living crisis, with Ukraine, all the things that your panel know about uh, only too well. And tomorrow we're going to get... Some answers, some of Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak's answers. A massive, multi-billion pound statement that we've barely mentioned today we'll be talking about tomorrow. And that will provide the key to whether or not people have trust in Boris Johnson handling the biggest issues. It's a very good uh, point, isn't it? And as you say, we haven't actually really mentioned uh, the uh, big rabbit that's going to come out of the hat tomorrow in the form of this statement from uh, the Chancellor, uh, Rishi Sunak. But it could be a game-changer uh, for Boris Johnson, at least that's what they hope anyway. Sam, thank you very much uh, for everything uh, tonight. Uh, busy uh, afternoon for you and another busy day, <laughs> I think, tomorrow too. Uh, in the meantime, that is it uh, from uh, The Take. Uh, what a day. The long-awaited Sue Gray report finally published. Will it change anything? In a minute, it feels like it may be uh, ticking along uh, as it was before. We will be back next week and every week on Wednesdays at 9pm. Next up, it's Sky News at 10. Thanks for watching. See you next week.